While America is known as the melting pot, one could argue that there's virtually no other population group that has shaped the past of the United States quite as strongly as German immigrants, with almost 7 million of them making their way to the New World over the course of four centuries. And today, 40 to 60 million Americans cite German as their primary origin, and thus represent the largest immigrant group even greater than those descended from Irish and Italians. But like a lot of families with immigration pasts, tracing down family roots can be kind of difficult because oftentimes names were changed altogether. Yeah, it's confusing, but extremely common. And I, like most Americans, kind of presumed that that name change happened on Ellis Island either unintentionally by an Ellis Island official who mixed up spelling, pronunciation, or place of origin. Okay. Come on, son. What is your name? Tuo nome. Vito Andolini from Corleone. Corleone. Vito Corleone. Or sometimes maliciously by a racist official with deeply seated xenophobia. Name? Okay, Mr. Smith. But both of those scenarios are more Hollywood tall tale than historical fact. Seriously, this is wildly fascinating and really took me by surprise. So let's go ahead and dive right in. One hundred and twenty-five years ago, the nation's first federal immigration station opened on Ellis Island in New York Harbor, built to handle the throngs who were coming to America during the late 19th century to escape famine, war, and poverty. They hoped to settle in a promised land that was opening its doors to many, especially those capable of doing manual labor. But even though many have had unusual names, at least unusual to an English speaker, it is a persistent myth that Ellis Island inspectors altered birth names of weary immigrants. After all, the 500 or so employees at the station had to work quickly during those first waves of immigration, processing each immigrant in a matter of just four to seven hours. The inspectors interviewed 400 to 500 people a day, processing over a million people a year during the height of the flow. On the record-breaking day of April 17, 1907, for example, almost 12,000 immigrants were processed. So yeah, to be honest, it sounds completely plausible that somebody could fudge an immigrant's name a little bit when entering it into the record books. Or maybe they might have just been making their best guess attempt at trying to understand a name from an immigrant who may or may not have even spoke English and probably had a pretty significant accent, right? Well, actually, that's pretty much completely wrong. According to the Smithsonian, Ellis Island inspectors were not responsible at all for recording immigrants' names. Instead, any likely error happened overseas. To leave your home country, whether it was Italy, Slovakia, Austria, Poland, or elsewhere, immigrants had to purchase a place on a ship, whether bound for New York or one of the other U.S. ports accepting immigrants at the time. At the shipping line station in Europe, a clerk wrote down the passenger's name in the ship's manifest, sometimes without even asking for identification to verify the spelling. The ship's manifest was then presented to Ellis Island inspectors after the boat docked. From there, the inspector would only cross-reference the name on the manifest with the immigrant passenger. So while it is totally plausible that maybe an immigrant from a landlocked country in Europe may have traveled to a port in another country in which that clerk might have misquoted them or incorrectly wrote down their name, for German immigrants specifically, that scenario isn't very likely. Although there are instances of Germans leaving through ports in Rotterdam, Antwerp, or others in France, the majority of Germans would have emigrated either through the ports of Bremen or Hamburg. 
In fact, from 1850 to 1891, 71% of all German and Eastern European immigrants left via one of these two German-speaking ports. In short, if your German family member left from a German port and had a reasonably common German last name, well, presuming that there was a clerical error is kind of the equivalent of someone leaving from London with the name of John Smith. It probably wasn't very likely that they actually got their name wrong. But to be honest, knowing what I know now, I think what bothers me the most about the Ellis Island myth is that it gives very little credit to just how linguistically talented the officials at Ellis Island actually were. According to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services website, from 1892 to 1924, one third of all immigrant inspectors were themselves foreign born, and all immigrant inspectors spoke an average of three languages. One of the island's best known interpreters was Fiorello LaGuardia, a U.S. congressman and three-term mayor of New York City, who worked at the immigration station during the day while he went to law school at night. LaGuardia was the son of an Italian father and a Jewish mother from Austria-Hungary, and spoke Italian, German, Yiddish, and Croatian. And here's the thing, I can totally see why just simply going to Ellis Island was probably a pretty scary experience for many of the immigrants at that time. Many migrants came from repressive regimes, where men in uniform were to be feared. And so upon arrival to the island, uniformed officials would have marked your clothing with letters signifying disease or separated migrants from their children or relatives for medical treatments or further questioning. Yeah, it could be pretty terrifying, but truth be told, being an immigrant going through Ellis Island, but also simultaneously being concerned that there wouldn't be anybody there who would actually be able to speak to you in your native tongue, well, that actually wasn't something that you really needed to worry about. Ellis Island workers would actually be assigned to inspect immigrants based on the languages they spoke. And if communications were still an issue, interpreters, often from immigrant aid societies, would actually be called in to help translate. And some of those societies even had offices within the Great Hall of the main Ellis Island building, which meant they weren't far from the inspection process. So if Ellis Island officials didn't maliciously change our family names, then why is this myth so persistent? And how exactly did it happen? Well, that kind of all depends on when and how and why your family immigrated to the United States in the first place. So for this bit, I'm actually gonna use my own family as an example. My German ancestors immigrated to the United States a bit earlier than Jonathan's. And I know of at least two instances where their first names were very much anglicized. My great-grandmother was born Antje Behrens. She became Anna Behrens. And my great-great-grandfather, who was born Heinrich Heferkamp, became Henry Heferkamp. Both of these family members immigrated to the United States in the early 1890s, and both continued using these anglicized names in the United States for all legal purposes from their marriage certificates to U.S. census records to literally having their assumed aliases written in stone on their graves. And at that time, this was totally legitimate because there weren't actually any real laws dictating when you could or couldn't change your name, as long, of course, as you were doing it without any ill intent. Let me explain what that means. According to scholars, as long as there was no ill intent, meaning you weren't trying to change your name to go into hiding after a crime, and you made a consistent and persistent effort to use that new name, then it was totally fine. In fact, prior to the early 1900s, there were no requirements for immigrants to use their real last name when they even came to America in the first place. They could give themselves any name they liked, as long as the name they gave matched up with the answers they gave according to their profile on the ship manifest, they were good to enter the nation with the use of any name they chose. They could even give their new name when being processed into the country, as long as they could be identified with someone on the ship manifest. They could also start using a new name once they entered the country after they got past the Ellis Island intake employees altogether. That being said, the U.S. Immigration Office itself even acknowledges that, quote, 
it's a well-known fact that immigrants did change their names and tended to do so within the first five years after arrival. And so in 1906, the US government enacted the Naturalization Act, which among other things, required formal documentation of name changes through the court system. And it's a system we still have in place today. And at the end of the day, there are a lot of reasons why someone might have felt like they wanted to change their last name, either to sound more American or to melt into the immigrant community where they were going to live, or because they were facing racism or xenophobia. I mean, let's be honest, at various points in American history, otherness wasn't really considered a good thing. When my own German family made the decision to emigrate to America, they left a lot of their German culture behind, including the ability to speak German. They chose not to speak it to their children, and so the language was pretty much lost. So while as a nation, we like to think of ourselves as a melting pot, bringing together people from different nations and cultures, well, the reality is that America hasn't always been very welcoming to people who look and speak different than us. In fact, there are some instances where people even changed their gender when they entered the United States. This was usually women pretending to be men because of the better work opportunities available to them. Most of the people who did this were actually never discovered. Those who were, maybe because they happened to get medical treatment or maybe they were involved in a romantic relationship, were actually not required to go back to using their biological gender. Once they were in the United States, they were pretty much free to be whoever they wanted to be. The few who were discovered, of course, made news headlines for a while, but then disappeared back into American history. In short, the rules for naming at Ellis Island were pretty lax, and subsequent residence within the United States was just that liberal at the time. Of course, the outcome of this kind of assimilation and name change does inherently make tracing back your ancestry kind of difficult. But at the end of the day, while nothing is impossible, name changes could happen. But they're not as likely as people have been led to believe. And they most likely didn't happen at Ellis Island. You know, this discussion of names and assimilation is actually something that's quite interesting for me specifically, because it's something that Jonathan and I have actually been kind of doing in reverse ever since we moved to Germany. When we decided to make Germany our home, making sure our sons were properly integrated into Germany was a top priority. With Jack, it meant hiring a Tagesmutter and then enrolling him in a German Kita so that he could learn to speak, read, write in German at the same age as German kids, in addition to learning German culture and customs. And while Jack is certainly a very American name, um, I'm not gonna give anything away too soon, but I will say that when choosing the name for our second son, uh, we very much had a discussion of that it had to be a name that was common in both the US and Germany and be a name that both Americans and Germans would be able to easily pronounce. Um, and maybe a little clue, this name actually happens to be a top 10 boys name in both countries right now. So if you wanna leave your guesses down below in the comment section, uh, yeah, you can totally go for it. But this is actually maybe a good transition to our final question that I always love to ask you guys to let me know down below in the comments. And that's to maybe tell me a little bit more about your family's history with your name, if you feel comfortable sharing that, of course. Um, I think ancestry and genealogy is so incredibly fascinating and the changing of last names specifically, it's a big deal. I know that there are probably a lot of different branches of my own family that have just been lost over time because of name changes. Like I mentioned, my maiden name is Oltmans with an O, but that's not to say that people with the last name of Altman with an A couldn't also be possibly related to me. Or maybe they dropped the S at the end, they dropped one of the Ns. Yeah, who knows, it's, it's, it's incredibly fascinating and this wasn't something that was generally unique to German immigrants, but happened to people from all sorts of different nationalities. 
So again, please be sure to let me know down below in the comment section. And as always, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from the Black Forest family, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you next Sunday. Tschüss.